Good morning and welcome to our services of Faith Family Fellowship today. Uh, we're glad that you've taken your time to join us in this time of worship. And I realize we live in extraordinary times. Uh, who would have thought that across America, uh, the doors of churches would be closed, but over the internet, there would literally be hundreds of uh, churches and hundreds of pastors who would be streaming the Word of God. Uh, and I think in many ways, maybe even getting the message out to even more people. But we're glad that you're here uh, with us today. Now, I don't know how it is in where you're living, but here in the state of New Jersey, uh, we are on lockdown. Uh, we have a nine o'clock curfew. We have to be in by nine o'clock in the evening, uh, except for essential services. Now, I got to be honest and tell you that I haven't had a nine o'clock curfew. Uh, well, I've never had a nine o'clock curfew. Even when I was a teenager, my curfew was 11 o'clock. But again, I realize that we live in extraordinary times. Uh, we live in er times when uh, we're challenged in many ways. But thank God that uh, He is still on the throne. His grace is still sufficient. And we can lean and rest upon His word. Now, at the end of the message today, I'm going to give you a, a few announcements uh, to tell you how we plan on going forward. But if you have your Bibles, please take it and take them now and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. The title of the message is uh, Let's Move Some Mountains. In Matthew chapter 13, and I'll give you just a moment to get there. Uh, I will remind you that uh, earlier in the chapter, uh, Jesus has been teaching in parables. And we understand that parables that uh, God uses, uh, Jesus is using an uh, earthly example to, to expand and expound upon a spiritual principle. But at the end of this teaching, we find in verse 53, it said when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And aren't his brothers named James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense in him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not many miracles there because of their lack of faith. This is an amazing passage we have here. Because we know who Jesus is. We know that He is the Son of God. We know that He is uh, the Creator of the world. And we know that at this point in time, His reputation had spread all through the area, that He was a great prophet, uh, a very uh, talented rabbi. Uh, he was a worker of miracles. And yet when He comes to His own hometown... They are skeptical of who he is. We know this guy. His mother is with us. We know his brothers. Uh, some of us here remember when he was growing up as a kid. Uh, where did he get all this knowledge? And where did he get all of this power? And the Bible simply says that because of their lack of faith, he did not many miracles in that place. What a missed opportunity. What, what uh, uh, an opportunity they had to see the power of God at work. And yet, because of their lack of faith, he did not any miracles there in his hometown of Nazareth. We serve a wonderful God. We serve a powerful God. Here's a newsflash for you. Scientists pinpoint exactly how the human body is killing the coronavirus. Now, this was an actual notification that I received on my smartphone while I was preparing this message. I want you to notice that they did not discover 
how they could make the human body beat the coronavirus. They figured out how the body in itself can do this. You see, it was God who designed your body and God who programmed it to take care of you. Let me share some scripture with you. Psalm chapter 139, verse 14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now we are told something about faith here. Something very primary about faith. If you're going to please God, you first of all have to believe in him. Now that would seem to be without question. However, we understand that there are many in our society and in our world today that have no belief in God. They look at this marvelous creation. They look around at the complexity of the human body. And they say, this is just the product of time and accidents. And yet the Bible tells us in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows his handiwork. We serve an all-powerful God. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, we read it just a moment ago, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Too often, I have said that I do not expect God to part the waters. But I would appreciate if he would just dry up a few mud puddles. Now, when I said that, I thought I was being cute, maybe even profound. But if I do not ask God to part the waters, why should he? If I never ask God to do something big, why should he do anything at all? If I believe that my God is all-powerful, shouldn't my faith demonstrate that? Every place I see God talking to his people in the word, he encourages them to ask for something big. Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 12 and 13. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. God is not hiding from us. God is not hiding from anybody. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. I don't know about you, but as I look at what's going on in our society today, I think we are living in a day of trouble. Everybody is going about. They're all worried. They're all concerned. This morning, my son-in-law and I stopped at a convenience store to get a cup of coffee. And they told us, first of all, that they were limiting the number of people in the door and that we had to keep six feet apart. Now, I understand the need for precaution, but I also understand that probably if you're going to get the coronavirus, six foot of separation is not going to do you a lot of good. But I think our faith in God can do for us what all of the plans of mankind cannot do. We are living in a day of trouble. Everyone is hoping that science will figure this thing out. Since when has science been our God? Since when have believers prayed to science to deliver them? Since when have the redeemed cowered in the face of the adversary? We have to ask ourselves the question, how big is our faith? Remember the words? Without faith, it is impossible 
to please God. Perhaps we should ask ourselves the question, can we trust our God? Is he trustworthy? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and how to reserve the unjust unto that day of judgment to be punished. Is God parting the waters at the Red Sea just a kitty tale? Is the virgin birth a myth? Is the resurrection of Jesus just a fable? Is the Holy Spirit an old wives' tale? Is the second coming just an empty promise? If we believe in these truths, if we believe that we serve a God of miracles, a God who is powerful, can't we have the faith to trust him that he is going to take care of us in the situation we find ourselves even today? Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 says, Call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Do you get it? If we call, he answers. In John chapter 14, we find an amazing passage. Jesus is speaking here. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now listen to this next phrase. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This passage amazes me. I go back to it time and time again. And I read what Jesus says. Greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Who is he talking about there? He's talking about us. He says that we will do greater works than he has done. Now, I've never made a blind man see. I've never cured the limbs of a lame man. I've never turned water into wine. I've definitely never raised the dead. I've been accused of putting some folks to sleep, but I've never raised the dead. I've never roused them up. And he says... Greater works than these will you do. And then immediately he transitions to talking about prayer. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. You know, the sad thing is, is that there are many Christians today. And there are many others who profess a belief in prayer. Who have not prayed since the last crisis. They think prayer is a, 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 a get out of trouble card. Uh, I've painted myself into a difficult situation, God, and it's your responsibility uh, to get me out of this, even though the decisions that got me here were my own decisions. We need to understand that prayer is a relationship. Now, the Father knows what we need even before we ask Him. And yet He says, Jesus said, in teaching the disciples, He said, not if you pray, but when you pray. The Son of God assumed that His followers, that His children, would talk to the Father, would pray, and then it's amazing how he taught them to pray. Pray our Father, not my Father, our Father, which art in heaven. Holy is your name. That draws us in to an intimate, personal relationship with Almighty God. Now, if you want a blessing today, here it is. Understand that the God of the universe, the God of all creation, the God of your salvation calls you into an intimate,
personal relationship with him. He says, ask of me. Tell me what you need. Talk to me. I am giving you this wonderful thing called prayer. Jesus says here, even the things that I do, you can do greater through prayer. Why have we forsaken prayer? Well, I will tell you that I think prayer is hard work. I've had people, I've listened to people, I've read stories of these great people of faith who talk about praying for two and three and four hours. I can't even imagine that. And I think maybe because we've heard so much about the longevity of prayer, it has frightened some of us off. When in reality, it is not the length of prayer, but it is the direction and focus of prayer. The Bible talks about the effectual, fervent prayer. That word effectual means focused, to, to, to pinpoint in on what our needs are and to go to the one that we know can provide those needs. The effectual fervent prayer, the heated prayer, the idea of a, a passion about prayer. When we go to God with, with those things in our heart, then God hears us. Listen to James chapter 4, verse 2. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from others. Yet you do not have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. I think it's reasonable to say at this point in time in our society, it is very reasonable to go to God and ask God to keep us from the danger of this virus, to ask God to protect our families, to ask God to watch over our brothers and sisters, and frankly, to ask God to give wisdom to those who are working for a cure, that they would find that cure. Because when it comes down to it, any healing that there is to be must principally come from our Heavenly Father. He is the great physician. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus speaking again. You don't have enough faith, Jesus said. I tell you the truth. If you had faith, even as, a, as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Let that sink in for a moment. Oftentimes, <clears throat> when I've read this passage, when I've heard others speak on this passage, they emphasize the faith of a mustard seed. Here's where I want to put the emphasis. If you have that kind of faith, you can move mountains. I think that's an amazing promise there. And he ends it with this, nothing, nothing would be impossible. Is Jesus just kidding around? Is he speaking metaphorically? I had somebody tell me one time, they said, you know, I prayed once, it didn't work out, so I just quit. <laughs> well, that's not effectual fervent prayer. Prayer demands consistency. Prayer demands involvement because it is a great resource that God has given us. In Matthew 21, 22, you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Now, <clears throat> I think sometimes <clears throat> we are in error that we give people kind of carte blanche, that they think they can uh, live any way they want to, do anything they want to, treat God any way they please, and then all of a sudden, when they find themselves in difficulties, that they can go to him and say, okay, here's the promise, whatever I ask in Jesus' name, you'll do it. 
But there is a qualification. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because. See, there's a conditional phrase there. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If you've tried prayer and it doesn't seem to work for you, maybe you need to ask these two questions. Am I keeping his commandments? And is my life, is my attitude, is it pleasing to him? I want to read this again. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Psalm 37, 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the, your heart's desires. But let me go back, to you, back with you to 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Psalm 37, 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord, do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The term desire there in Hebrew means your requests and petitions. Delight in the Lord, it's saying, he'll answer your prayer. He'll take care of you. Psalm 84, 11 and 12. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from you who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in him. You know, sometimes we think that God is a, uh, a grumpy heavenly father. And he wants to take things away from us that we can enjoy. But let me suggest to you that God never tells us to not to do something that is beneficial to us, that will bless us, that will help us. If God says don't do it, it's because it will harm us. And we are told here by the psalmist, God will withhold no good thing from you. That's our loving Heavenly Father. Now, do you know the key to making a million dollars, the key to being wealthy, I'll tell you what it is. When others are selling, you buy. A few years ago, I think it was in 2008, after that big stock market crash, Avis Rent-A-Car went to 49 cents a share. Everybody was selling it off. Everybody knew that, that, that there was going to be economic collapse. But people who were smart rushed in, and they bought thousands of shares of Avis Rent-A-Car, which is now at $69 a share. You say, why do you use that example? Because those who would do something extraordinary need to recognize their opportunities. Folks, I believe, uh, I believe we've got an opportunity for us. Uh, we can uh, lose our head. Uh, we can cower in fear. Or we can remember who we are. We are children of God. We are related to the ultimate power of the universe. Instead of retreating and cowering, let's stand up and be bold in our faith and in our testimony. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. If this would be it. Now, let me just digress for a moment. If this would be it, if this is the end of all things, if if this is going to culminate in a, a universal plague, and if there are going to be millions who die, and if this will be the lead up to the end of the world, then, uh, which I don't think it is, but let me say that I don't want to go out with a whimper. I want to go out with a bang. I want to go out 
as God wants us to be, victorious. Who is he that overcomes the world? Our faith gives us that ability to overcome. So let me ask you this question. What are you going to do during your time of quarantine? Are you going to spend your time binge watching on Netflix? Or can we turn in faith to our Heavenly Father and do something for Him? That could very well be extraordinary. Let me give you a few things this morning that I think we need to do. First of all, as you pray, ask God to restore your spiritual passion. I think we should be excited about the things of God. There's some people up in New England this past week who got real excited about the fact that they were losing their quarterback of 20 years. Tom Brady is going to become a member of the Tampa Bay Buccaneer. Oh no, it's the end of the world for some of them. And some of them are angry. Some are being benevolent. Now I don't know what they're doing back down in Tampa Bay. But I will tell you this, I know, I know that people are passionate about their football, at least those who are into football. Could I encourage us to be passionate about our Lord? To be passionate about the things of God? Lord, give me the passion for spiritual things. I think we need to be passionate about the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9 but if I say, I'll never mention the Lord or speak in His name, uh, his, word, his Word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I, I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I think that's the way we ought to feel about the Word of God. Jeremiah said, you know, I'm all fed up with this thing. I'm all fed up with this spiritual thing. And I'm just not going to talk about God or His Word anymore. But he said, you know, when I tried to do that, he said, I felt the fire of God's Word burning inside me. He said, if I tried not to talk about Him, he said, it just wore me out. Oh, I pray that God would restore in us a passion for His Word. Thy Word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. If you're confused about anything, go into God's Word. Read God's Word. You will be amazed how amazing it is. I've been a serious student of the Word of God for almost 50 years. And I will tell you that the more I study it, the more I read it, the more I see the need to study it more. It is so amazing. It is so incredible. And the Bible does not contain the Word. The Bible is the very Word of God. We need to pray that God gives us a passion for His Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, for it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What, what do you know about a drunk man? A drunk man is not in control of himself. And the Bible says... Don't let something like wine control you. Instead, let the Spirit of God control you. You know, we have an amazing gift today. God lives in us. He is there with us to comfort us, to teach us, to empower us, to fill us, to direct us, to answer the questions we have. If we will just recognize that He is there, so often we ignore him. He is like a minor player in the great role of life. There's the Father, the Son. Oh, and there's the Spirit. But Jesus said, before I go, I'm not going to leave you without help. I'm going to send my Spirit to you. And he will live in you. And he will never depart from you. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit is our hedge against doing wrong. We need to pray for a passion for the Word of God. We need to pray for a passion for the Spirit of God. And we need to pray for a spirit of revival, a passion for revival. 
Habakkuk in a terrible time prayed this prayer. He, he, Habakkuk 3, 2. O Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known the wrath. In your wrath, remember mercy. Revive your work. Somewhere along the line, we've got the idea that revival had to do with people getting saved. Well, that's a byproduct of revival. You see, lost people don't need revival. Lost people need resurrection. They're dead in sin. It's the saved people, the children of God, who need revival. That's resuscitation. For God's Spirit to breathe on us powerfully. And we redirect our resource. We redirect our passion. Remember when you first got saved? What a wonderful time that was. Sins were gone. Your whole life was new. You became a new creature in Christ. And then the world began to sink back in. And then life began to tell you that all this thing about serving God it was just not what you thought it was going to be. But I will tell you today, during this time of national crisis, God's children need to stand up and be revived in their spirit and stand in faith for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we need to pray for the restoration of our spiritual power. We need to pray for God to infuse us with his power. I love this story in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, now this was in a time of persecution. Uh, Peter and John had been threatened by the Sanhedrin. Uh, they went back to their uh, friends, uh, and it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. We need to shake things up. Did you see that? They prayed, and the power of the Spirit fell in such power that even the building began to shake. Folks, I think we could do that again. I think we could see revival come in our hearts through this time of difficulty, if we would just trust God and let him take care of the things we cannot take care of and then for us to take care of the business that Jesus left for us to do, to be witnesses. Third, ask God to provide. Now you can fill in the blank here. Ask God to provide for my finances, for my health, for my family. Fill in any blank you want. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. But my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We are tapping into the bank of our eternal God who wants to take care of us if we would just trust him. Everybody is waiting to see what the government is going to do to take care of them. Well, there's a greater power than the government, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fourth, ask the Holy Spirit to empower your witness. People are asking questions. I had a young lady who was a teenager in my ministry years ago. And the other day, in the midst of all this, she sent me a message, and she said, Pastor Walls, can you tell me if this is the end of the world? That I see things out there, there are earthquakes, and uh, now we've got this disease, and I just want to know, uh, do you think that this is the end of the world? And I wrote back to her and I said, uh, you know, there's always been earthquakes, uh, there's always been floods, there's always been disease. Uh, we've always seen these signs. And so this is not necessarily the end but it could be. I mean, really, what if it was? What if this was the countdown to the end? Do you know Jesus is your Savior? Are you ready for it? And I told her, 
I said the most important thing at this point is to know that you know that Jesus is your Savior. And whether you live for 100 years or whether all of this is winding down to the end, be sure that you know Jesus as your Savior. And I will tell you each and every one the same thing. Be sure of your salvation. And I would hope that this would renew in you a passion to see your family know Jesus as well. To see your friends come to know Christ. Jesus, before he ascended to the right hand of the Father, said, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. See, that's, all, that's what the power of the Holy Spirit is all about, to witness. So during this time, speak up. People are asking questions. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, you know the answer. Share that answer with them. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our Father, that's his heart. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Take heart today, my friend. God is still in control. God is still all-powerful. I pray that you will trust him. And let's pray and have faith and get into the word. And let's move some mountains for God. Father, thank you for our time in the word together. I pray that this might be a time of encouragement for your people. Thank you, Lord, for those who have turned in. I pray that this has been a profitable time. And help us, Lord, today as Christians to reach out to others, encouraging, comforting, helping them, and telling them about the Lord Jesus. Lord, may you receive glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.